Hi, I'm Tom Henriksen from the DevOps Online Summit. Today, I'm joined by Jonathan Johnson, a cloud native and Kubernetes expert. Jonathan, you've been here with us before, but introduce yourself. Maybe there's a few people joining us new here at the DevOps Online Summit. Hi, Tom. Thanks. Uh, um, it's nice to see you again and be back with uh, your crew and uh, your agenda here. I, um, yeah, the last time I talked, I gave a couple of presentations on uh, DevOps related to Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a, I don't know, not an evangelist. That would be the wrong thing to say. I, uh, evangelist definitely of open source. Um, yeah. But certainly I like to talk about Kubernetes because a lot of us are in the industry are struggling with it in mm -hmm. a sense of, we all know how to develop applications, but there's this new thing about like, okay, now I want to deliver those applications to one of my customers and Kubernetes is in the way. So I just wanted to uh, say it's, I, usually what I say in my talks is it's, it's, it's lengthy and it's, it's a lengthy process and there's a learning curve there. Um, but I also like to, Tell people it's actually an enjoyable journey. There's a lot of once you get it and you start getting into it, it's quite enjoyable. One of those enjoyments is actually encouraging people to do CI CD pipelines, mm -hmm. actually on Kubernetes. It's actually a very good layer underneath your pipeline infrastructure to, to do that. Maybe if you have you consider your DevOps CI CD pipeline plane, there's a word plane, right? And then you have your Kubernetes plane, yeah. and then you have your cloud native plane. So you have these different layers or planes. And uh, I like to talk about that. Yeah. So it's fun. Yeah, that makes me think about, you know, people who like like a sandwich plane. That seems like Kubernetes or CI CD pipelines, they don't ever seem to be plain, but I'm sure there's there's a few out there that are pretty basic. Um, but I'm sure you get to see a lot of them. But but today, Jonathan, you're here to talk to us about cloud native applications. Oh, yeah. So kind of start us off in level set. What are cloud native applications? Well, Tom, one of the things I do is I, in my talks, and I, I do these talk, I do a talk on like Kubernetes fundamentals. So mm -hmm. when you ever do a talk that's fundamentals, you start introducing new concepts, and new concepts are always in our industry wrapped around words and labels. So I have to, there's a lot of explanation to do or demystify, right? Can people build up all these concepts of like what a cloud is uh, and what a cloud native is? It's like, well, what is, what is that? I mean, you've heard about cloud, what's cloud native? Um, so I spent a lot of my time um, talking about terms and what they mean. Um, and in doing so, I find it Throughout my career, even before Kubernetes, containers, microservices, another weird word, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I find it very entertaining to come across all these different words and the way engineers tend to use these words or, or fit them to meet their needs. Right? We've, we've seen the thing with, with master, the awful word of master using within GitHub. Fortunately, they moved away from it. Uh, master slave technology. Yep. Uh, Kubernetes has moved away from that. It's no longer the master control nodes and the worker nodes. It's now the control plane nodes. And that control plane, and they're introducing the word plane there. Uh, Redis, I think they're too tightly coupled to the word master slave, um, unfortunately, but they're, they're trying to work themselves out of that tight coupling. So that's a good, good example of us in engineering land not understanding the use of words. Um, and getting better about it. But uh, I guess my advice also would be to any spouse out there who's going to have a child and you're listening to your other spouse and the other spouse happens to be a software engineer. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't let that software engineer name your child because we are really bad at variable names, class mm -hmm. names, and naming technologies, right? Yeah. Uh, wait, what is it? Nil is the new null. <laughs> But don't name your child nil yeah. or nil A and B or nil green blue. Mm -hmm. um, .NET, the language of .NET. Right? How do you explain that to somebody who's new to software? .NET is all caps. Isn't that a website extension? Yeah. What about the doc, .org language? No, no, no. It has nothing to do with that. Right? And then you got C, C++. Mm -hmm. like C Sharp. Sharp. C Pound. <laughs> 
I was, you know, if I was going to name a language, I would call it A plus. Yeah. It'd be passing. You know, that's, that's a success. C is just like passing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There's a lot of names out there, isn't there, Jonathan, that we were <laughs> just kind of, you you kind of scratch your head as you think back and what were they thinking? But I don't, you know, it's even, you get into data planes, mm-hmm. right? And then you data lakes. Yeah. Lake behind me, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then you could talk about monoliths and mountains of software, you know, yeah. and planes of software. So we have, we definitely have this geographic, you know, terminology, technology usage in our terms. Um, and you talk about pipelines. So then there's a, this connotation of water and streams. And that's another thing, streams and water and pipelines. And the pipelines, whenever they're held up, they're always in bottlenecks. But they're yes. never dams. Although in every organization I've been in, when the pipeline doesn't move, to me it's a dam. It's not a yeah. bottleneck. <laughs> exactly. I really exactly. want to crucify it. Um, uh, I talk about cloud native. I talk about you know everything on Kubernetes should be. You treat everything as very ephemeral. In other words, things mm-hmm. are. Uh, you should be able to shut down your containers and start your containers very quickly, uh, as opposed to virtual machines, VMs. VMs are heavyweight. They're gigabytes in size. Yeah, uh, they're not easy to configure, maintain. They tend to be precious snowflakes. Right? They tend to be those pets. And Martin Fowler, I'll give you a link to the, his site. Mm-hmm. Martin Fowler talks about pets versus cattle. Yeah, and he also talks about snowflakes. He use different words for those things. Um, and it's what you entertain me too. Is like there was a company that came out talk about uh, uh, data warehousing. And the name of the company is called snowflake.com. Yet our whole industry is talking about cloud native software. Yeah. Where we want to tra- treat more things as ephemeral uh, containers, treat them more like pets or not like precious snowflakes. <laughs> so we're all yeah. over the place in terms of. Yeah. Well, that's a big paradigm shift, though, isn't it? For people from, like you talked about, the virtual machine era into like the containers, Kubernetes, you know, Docker first, you know. Kind of that it's a it's kind of a different way of thinking about things, isn't it? It is. Uh, although we're, you know, um, some would say, of course, and I agree with it, is that you know when you start getting into Docker and getting into containers, some people say, oh, it's just like a VM. Is this a VM? It has that feeling to it. Yes, mm-hmm. and I, from a developer perspective, from an architectural perspective, from a Linux security perspective. Uh, from many other perspectives, no, a VM is not like, uh, 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 and I shouldn't say a Docker container, but an OCI, Open Container Initiative compliant container. Yeah. Um, are those containers um, VMs? No, they're not really. In fact, there's no hypervisor involved. In fact, when you run a container, mm-hmm. it's just a Linux process, really. It's a Linux process that has extra wrapping around it to make it secure and isolated, to have its own file system, its own root system, its own user system. So it's isolated in terms of security and context, but it's really just a Linux process on the host machine. There's no yeah. hypervisor involved. So, yeah. But yeah, to us developers, it looks very much the same, but it's much faster, which is, yeah. that was a taking off of it. So anyways, your, your question, long diatribe there, your question about like what is cloud native? Um, cloud is a funny word, um, and we all know. I mean, it's advertised on TV now. You know, come to the cloud. But yeah. I wonder how many people watching TV really know even what that means, and they all talk in these commercials like, "Oh, hmm. come to the cloud." It's like, <laughs> oh, okay. I'll take Here my Tesla go. and drive it. My <laughs> Tesla knows how to get there, right? Yeah. Self driving. Take me to the cloud, Tesla. But <laughs> you know. You know, um, it, okay, cloud. All right. So it's it's machines, and and the, the weird thing about this cloud native community is that we're very adverse to admitting that it's actually running on machines. We're bending over backwards to create all these words to say, yeah, well, it's it's just something that's running over here. Well, what is it running on? Well, it's the cloud. It's running on a machine. You know, the whole serverless thing. Mm-hmm. Right? We talk about serverless. What serverless mean? Well, it's still running on a server. It just says it means that you are less exposed to the inner workings 
Mm -hmm. And the, you don't care about that because it's, because the hardware itself is more of a commodity now, right? So, yeah. Okay, good. Yep. So what does native mean? You know, funny, <laughs> cloud native. You know, when I was in grammar school, like everybody said, like, put your adjective before your noun. Like, okay, well, native is both a noun and an adjective. <laughs> and cloud, cloud's the noun. So why is it native? And why is it native cloud instead of cloud native? I don't know. <sighs> it's so hard to talk about this stuff because it's like people are like, they come up with all these different ideas because they're filling in the gaps. For yeah. So anyways, native, native, here, let me give you a definition. I, I found this, okay, Wikipedia is not the best place for definitions. <laughs> but but we, yes. I like what Wikipedia says. In computing, native software is the data formats or, or, or data formats. So software data formats are mm -hmm. those that are designed to run in a particular Operating system. Good. I like that. In a more technical sense, here we go, Wikipedia. Native code is often written specifically for a certain processor, like an ARM, yep. right? And, and uh, in contrast, cross-platform software, like Java, write yeah. once, run anywhere, mm -hmm. can be run on multiple operating systems on computing architectures. That, to me, cross-platform that's Kubernetes. What yep. is the container engine? The container engine is package once run anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's just like the JRE, except it's true polyglot. Yeah. Uh, they, in the Wikipedia, oh, they also said like a Game Boy, Game Boy cartridge. You take a Game Boy cartridge, you jam it into the Game Boy machine, and you get your Game Boy engine. You can't just put that cartridge into a, an Apple IIe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It, that wouldn't they're work they're too designed well. for something, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, cloud native, when you talk about cloud native, it has nothing to do with native. It actually has to do with more, it runs anywhere ubiquitously. Yeah. So it, I just want to let you know, it's a mishmash of words. Mm -hmm. What cloud native means, it means those things that are written to be running on cloud systems. Yeah. But cloud systems, by the way, could be, yes, running on Google, Azure, IBM Cloud, mm -hmm. Oracle Cloud. Okay, yeah, Amazon Cloud, that other small one. Yeah, they're just a small player. Yeah, it's just, you know, I mentioned them because I feel bad. Um, but the, uh, the cloud systems, there's, there's um, public clouds and there's private clouds. Okay, another really bad name for public clouds. Public clouds, why would you want to make your stuff public? We have hackers from foreign countries coming in, disrupting us. Yeah. We want to public, you want to lock down secure. So, yeah. okay, it's clouds that are somewhere else. It's mm -hmm. the hardware, it's somewhere else. It's a commodity we buy. Yeah. But there's also private clouds, which means it's the cloud, the hardware that we buy, that we have within our own data center. That's the other word, data center. And then within a data center, you have a, Cluster. These are all the words I have to introduce in the fundamentals of Kubernetes. The, um, but cloud native development means you're running cloud software, typically in containers. It used to be in VMs, but now it's containers. And it's on either public or private clouds, on data centers. And now that you have a lots of containers, it's a cluster sure. across yeah. a cluster of hardware and by the way, that hardware could be a stack of Raspberry Pis. It's a fellow by the name of Alex Ellis, who does a lot of talking about Kubernetes and edge computing. It's a rising uh, special interest group in the Kubernetes mm -hmm. space is edge computing. That's another one, edge computing. What is that? What's well, on the edge of the cloud? Well, clouds don't have edges, but it's on the edge. You mean it's like stuff that's running on physical hardware, like you know, hardened environmental computers? Yeah, but that's hardware. We won't talk about that. It's the edge, brother. <laughs> Killing me, it really is. Anyways, so that's Raspberry Pis. You can run Kubernetes Raspberry Pis. You can run Kubernetes on a laptop, right? Yeah. It's, uh, that's all cloud. Mm -hmm. And that's all cloud native development. What is the operating system of cloud native? It's Kubernetes now. 
That is the de facto operating system. We all know that there's lots of operating systems that can run on laptops, Chromebooks, Mac OS, Linux, whatever it is. Right now in the industry, we have done one dominant end, uh, operating system for cloud native distributed computing. And that's another word I want to introduce, right? So cloud native distributed computing is really what this is all about. Distributed yeah. computing. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not a big fan of, I wish the cloud native computing foundation was actually called, you know, distributed if I was computing. Yeah. it was called the distributed operating, the, the, sorry, distributed computing operating <laughs> system, or sorry, the distributed computing foundation. See, I can't even do the name right, so I'm not good at that. So I'm yeah, glad it's a mouthful. It is, mm -hmm. but it should be the, the, the sub foundation of the Linux foundation is, is called the CNCF, yes. Cognitive yep. Computing Foundation. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's really about distributed computing because you're, it's really about taking an application that you would have run as a monolith. Yeah. And you've now broken it into services, small tasks, yep. small database engines or engines or some services of some sort, Kafka messaging systems, systems. and yeah. you're running them all on different containers on Kubernetes, which happens to be a cluster of distributed computing. Mm -hmm. Kubernetes is a, a lot of people, some people walk away from Kubernetes because they're like, ah, it's too hard. The reason they walk away from it, and it's not necessarily that Kubernetes is hard. It's the fact that distributed computing is hard. Kubernetes yeah. is just a tool. It's not trying to make it easier. Mm -hmm. Right, Docker, came along and they made containerization easier. Yep. Thank you, Docker. You did a really good job at that. Really good community. Mm -hmm. They made that something that we could wrap our heads around as software engineers. Yeah. Google came along and said, hey, we have an idea to make distributed QEing easier. It's mm -hmm. this tool called Kubernetes. Like, yeah, it's too hard. No, distributing computing is hard. That's what's hard. Yeah. Wow. Oh. Um, so what is we kind of come back to the, the main benefits, because you kind of touched on some of those, but what are some of the main benefits that are out there to, to kind of make this move? Yeah. Uh, resources. Mm -hmm. There's a big cost to going to Kubernetes and distributed computing cloud native. There's a big cost to it. The, the fallacies of distributed computing. That, that, th those eight postulates have been around way before Kubernetes was yeah. thought about. Um, in fact, it came out of Sun. Um, but uh, that's the downside of it. But the mm -hmm. benefit is it's on the same sword, you know, double-edged sword. The yeah. benefit is you get CPU, memory, and I.O. not on one brick. Yep. You get CPU, memory, and I.O. across that cluster. Mm -hmm of multiple machines. And what do we love as software developers? What, what, is, what is the commodity that we love to spend? We love to spend CPU, memory, and IO, mm -hmm. especially with Python. <laughs> 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 that's my yes. Python dig. Okay. But oh, with Python, cool. you know, you need CPU, memory, and IO. Mm -hmm. That's what you get with Kubernetes. Kubernetes is an operating system that manages um, CPU, memory, and IO. Mm -hmm. You know, any operating system running on any brick yeah. What does it do? It manages the CPU memory and I.O. Mm -hmm. Kubernetes is an operating system. It's not in the traditional sense, but it is an operating system that's managing CPU memory and I.O. across those devices. Yeah. So as an application developer, you as an operating system make that easier for me. So you, what do you get? You get power of scalability. Mm -hmm. Okay, you also get the power of, it's, it's a state machine too. So you get the power of resilience. I told you to run 100 applications, 100 microservices for me. Mm -hmm. um, please run those until the end of time. Right? Yes. Of course, the you end of time. What is, what's the, uh, I actually want to do a keynote on this. What is, the, uh, what is the thing that causes all of our software to break down? It's entropy. Mm -hmm. Entropy is universal in the universe, and it's universal in software. Oh, yeah. I have that with my software all the time. Every time somebody says, hey, can you run that again? I'm like, oh, maybe. <laughs> it ran last week, but you know entropy. It's yeah. there all the time. But Kubernetes is a, something that helps you guarantee high availability. So 
So as we move to this, because you kind of alluded to this a little bit, Jonathan, that distributed computing can be a little more complex than what we're used to. So as people move to it, is that kind of one of the main pain points is just kind of wrapping their heads around, you know, I've made this change. I now have to design my software a bit differently. It is a mental shift. Yeah, it really is. And it's harder, you know, and it's not something I would recommend for, you know, a small startup, but not something I recommend for a uh, new venture necessarily right out of the box. Like, okay, let's write it in Kubernetes first, then figure out what we're going to do. Like, no, yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> figure out what you're going to do. And then if you need the scalability and the resilience of cloud development, go for it, but um, don't do it until then. Um, so there, uh, there is a learning curve to it. And it, it is, it is difficult. Yep. Yeah. Cause you mentioned that. So I guess, you know, as people think about this, what are some resources? Cause I know you, you have a lot yourself that you could share to, you know, people want to learn more about this and kind of tackle that problem. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll reference my materials too. I mean, I got started with a book. This is a, I love this book. This is Kelsey Hightower's Brendan Burns and Joe Beta. Now this is an old copy of it. Um, that shows up really nicely with my green screen. Um, <laughs> these fellows, uh, Kelsey Hightower is a big proponent, proponent, uh, and CNCF ambassador, I believe, yeah. uh, of uh, Kubernetes and cloud native development. Great fellow to watch and listen and learn from. Highly recommended. Brendan Burns, Joe Beta, Craig McCaughey too, as well. They're the founders of Kubernetes. So mm -hmm. that's a good book. The one I just showed you is the first version. They have a second draft. Um, version two of that, um, so it's a better read. So yeah. Kubernetes up and running. It's a great way to get started. Um, before that, the way I got started was reading Sam Newman's book, um, Building Microservices. And he has a new book that came out last year called Monolith to Microservices. Both really good reads. Yeah. The other read that's coming to my head, oh, I don't have my backpack with me. It's called um, Fundamentals of Software Architecture. Okay. Neil Ford and yep. Mark Richards, yeah. um, highly recommended. If you're thinking about architectures in the cloud native space, they talk about space-based architectures in there. But I do a lot of training and yeah. I'll show you, I'll give you, Tom, the, the links to all my trainings down below. Sure. I do a lot of, um, I do a workshop for O'Reilly mm -hmm. called um, Kubernetes Fundamentals in Three Weeks. And it's a, it's a three weeks, three hours a week, three weeks, nine hours total. Yep. Gets you started with Kubernetes. If you don't know about cloud native, and it's more of this same ideas. And I show you, it's actually hands-on. I'll show you how to do stuff. Um, I follow up that up with another one called Kubernetes Intermediate in three weeks. And I talk about the operator pattern. I talk about service meshes. And I talk about CI, CD doing pipelines oh, really? okay. natively on Kubernetes. Same amount of time, nine, three, yep, three same hours thing. a week. Three okay. weeks, nine hours total. Gotcha. Yep, yep. So those are, uh, I do those once a month. They alternate, you know, intermediate, fundamentals, intermediate. Mm -hmm. I also do it for the APAC region. So I don't know if you have oh, any wow. listeners around the APAC. Yeah. <laughs> my, I'm guessing you're getting nights. up at odd hours then. Yeah. Yeah. You got it. Yep. Um, let's see. I also do another training on there called um, Kubernetes testing. Uh, so I talk about chaos engineering on Kubernetes and consumer driven contracts. It's another type of testing Interesting. technique. Yeah. Wow. Um, I, I also have office hours on O'Reilly. So if you can just show oh, up you? and I don't do any presentations, I mm -hmm. just answer questions. Answer questions. Windows. That's cool. Great. Yeah, um, but you get a lot of interesting questions, I'm guessing, when you do something like that. Yeah, I'm actually collecting a, uh, a journal of oh, all these great questions cool. from all my pe all these people yeah. that are listening. Yeah. And um, every time somebody sends me a question, I put it in the document, I answer it, mm -hmm. and uh, I make it aware. I should probably put it into a blog or something. Yeah, I that's what I was thinking. That would be a good blog or some like a resource to maybe help you develop something. Because that's I am writing a book. Um, yeah, cool. Uh, we're still working on the title for it, but it's, it's around Kubernetes and mm -hmm. a lot of the answers will go into the book as well. Yeah. So cool. I'm using it for my evil wares. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm also, uh, so I also do a lot of uh, traveling with No Fluff Just Stuff mm -hmm. before the pandemic for yeah. a few years. Great, it's a great group. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we travel around to uh, a whole bunch of cities in the United States. Um, yeah. We go Are to- Are you guys starting to come back? Are they starting to schedule more of those? Yeah, we're coming back in the fall. Um, cool. And we're going back. We do virtual tools tours, mm -hmm. so it's actually yeah, I've seen a couple of those. subscription model. Yep. You do both virtual as well as mm -hmm. uh, you can show up to a city and do it. We go to Columbus, Ohio, Des Moines, Iowa. Yeah. Uh, Wake, but we're just outside of Boston, Denver, Colorado, Dallas, uh, mm -hmm. St. Louis, uh, Reston, Virginia, Austin, Texas, Dallas, Texas, uh, Chicago. Yeah. And yeah, we'll put Clearwater, the links in. Put the links in the show notes so that people, if one's close by, they can come Absolutely. see you. Come see me yeah. as well. And not just me, because mm -hmm. it's not about me. Uh, I have a whole bunch of friends that I travel with. Yeah. And they are fantastic speakers, much better than me. Yeah. They, they write books yeah. much better than me. So go for them and mm -hmm. I'll be happy to have a beer with you. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Yeah. I know I've been to a few of those myself. I've, like you said, a lot of good speakers at those. So. Definitely highly recommend them. Very professional. So. And if for anybody who's listening and they they live or going to London, I will be in London in mid-November uh, for a software design and development conference. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Jonathan, you've shared a lot with us. Thank you so much for sharing your time. It's my pleasure. It was great. Excellent. Got me all, all fired up. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I can see <laughs> you're probably getting nice and warm by the fire. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your time and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. On behalf of Jonathan Johnson, I am Tom Henriksen for the DevOps Online Summit.